drive and started taking stools. And the kids, in the case, they saw uh, the students. The students uh, gathered around him, listened to the stool, and said, please tell it again. It's quite an interesting story. So this fellow said, uh, I, I don't know this entire story. What I know is only a part of the story. In Sanskrit, or Sanskrit, whatever you call it. Sanskrit, perhaps in Pune, it is Sanskrit. Ashtadasha Sastrani, Ashtadasha Shatamacha, Aam Vetti, Shupo Vetti, Sanjaya Vetti, Vanya. It means uh, maybe about 8000 or 8800 or so lines. I, of this story I know. But I don't know everything. Maybe Shukra knows about the same amount. Maybe Sanjay knows an equal amount. And all of that is one single story. Uh, now, by the way, I mentioned this. This is this comes at the beginning of the Mahabharata. You, you have heard of the Mahabharata. <laughs> A.K. Ramanujan used to say that everybody in India knows the Mahabharata because nobody reads it. <laughs> it is in the oral tradition. Oral tradition. Uh, very brilliant observation. But this uh, the language that Shukra spoke was uh, language that language that Shukra spoke was not Sanskrit. Language that Sanjay spoke was Sanskrit. And this this fellow, Ugras Ramanas in Maharshan engagement, it was a, it was maybe a non-Sanskrit, maybe a Paishachit, maybe a Prakrut, maybe we don't know the name of that. The story existed in several languages. That has been our tradition. Presence of many languages together does not make us unhappy. You won't question this, you will accept it with a kind of natural tolerance towards languages. When Kalidas wrote his plays, his character spoke in the same play. Not, you, you did not have to buy six different tickets for them. Six different languages in the same play. There is, you know, uh, up to the 17th century, when uh, uh, poets wrote, when Asaf Khan died, Asaf Pilas was written using about 70 different languages in the same poem. So many languages in one work of literature, one creation, many languages were accepted as part of life. Maybe when, uh, when Shankaracharya, Adi Shankara, walked from Kerala to Kashmir, uh, he obviously had not learned the English language. You know? <laughs> but he must have spoken along the way this is about the 9th century. Along the way, he, was, he must have spoken some Tamil as well, some early form of Kannada, some early form of Marathi. These are two at least vying for status as classical languages, so I believe they exist in those days. Some, some, you know, uh, then uh, moving up you know, to Kashmir, he must have spoken early form of Kashmir, or at least tolerated hearing these languages. Language diversity has been a way of life for people in this part of the country, this, this part of the world. Today, all over the world, there is an anxiety, a worry, that languages are dying or will die very soon. To give you an idea as to what is the volume of the worry, what, what, is, the, what is the scale of the anxiety, it is believed that at the moment there are about 6,000 languages, living languages in the world. And it is believed, and this is not, when I say it is believed, I am not speaking about journalists, writers, publishers, uh, students of literature or teachers of literature, because all of them depend on languages and they tend to overstate the case. But this estimation that I am going to mention, it has come from mathematicians. In mathematics, uh, you have mathematical modeling for languages. And on the basis of mathematical modeling, it is believed 
that by the end of this century, the 21st century, 4,000 of the existing 6,000 languages will have gone. No trace of those languages will be left. When I say no trace of the languages will be left, please do not misunderstand me. A language does not die like a buffalo dies. <laughs> it is not a biological system. It does not have birth, growth and death as, a biolog as, as humans have birth, growth and death or crows or buffaloes or snakes or tigers have birth. Languages are a symbolic system. They are not organic. They're not, they don't have life as life is. Uh, they, have a, they have a functionality, they have dynamism, they have energy of a different kind. So when I say languages die without leaving a trace, please imagine the death of language as death of a mountain. Imagine if a mountain dies, uh, of some pebbles, some rocks, some minerals, uh, some uh, boulders will be left there. Like when a language dies, its words are left scattered in neighboring languages. They left, sometimes they are recovered, they are brought into practice by other languages. A few grammatical features of a given language also get assimilated, uh, assimilated in other languages and so on. For instance, uh, irrigativity is not a, you know, in the English language has, well, in simple words, uh, you have only the first person pronoun, singular pronoun is I. Me, my, I, uh, ami, hum, we. But slowly, when the English got exposed, to, exposed to other languages, by the 18th century, middle of the 18th century, the English language decided to use sentences like, "Well, one does not know if the weather will be good or not." Now, this one replacing I entered the English language. It was not there. It was not there in Shakespeare's English because it was available in other languages, in Europe and in Africa. English are the acquired. So the certain grammatical features also get scattered. When I, when I say languages will die, it is not that they will disappear completely, uh, as if, uh, as if the, the material of which they are made, languages are made of uh, invisible material, sound waves, sound waves, nothing more. It is absolutely uh, uh, shapeless, uh, shapeless, uh, dimen uh, dimensionless sound waves that the language uh, uses. But when the language is some of those things remain. However, the mainstay of the language, which is grammar, uh, which is cohesive system of meaning, uh, which is the ability to communicate some uh, some uh, extensive uh, extensive part of one's uh, thought <coughs> that is six thousand living languages of these four thousand may go of the remaining two thousand languages about seventeen hundred languages will survive without their limbs intact now supposing you know you see uh, you see me as a living person here. But imagine that in the next five minutes my arms drop off. You know in Kafka, Franz Kafka's story, Metamorphosis, a human being suddenly becomes a vermin and insect. So my arms drop off. Then after seven minutes my ears go. I mean people have told me that I got two arms. Yes. Uh, my, my legs go. I still remain there. So that is for a language, domain of a language is the limb. Domains of language are limbs for a language. Now what are these domains? The domains are, say you use a language in the marketplace. That's one domain of language. You use language for, for justice or law. When you want to go and fight with the principle, you, know, you use Marathi language as the domain of Marathi. Is for for justice and law, for medicine, for health care, that's another domain. But today, if I go to doctor, I go to the 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 doctor, Can you raise your hands, those who said no? Okay. Now those who said no, can you raise? So I just go, fine. 
uh, forgive me for using this example. Indra Gupta, doctor. So the, then the doctor thinks about it and then tells you an English name for your pain. So often, you also start talking to the doctor about your pain using the English language. As uh, Dr. Maratma answer, the joy treatment gets you. The Marchavaji procedures are the domain of language for articulation of pain is lost to a language that is loss of language domain. I gave you example of pain, description of pain. Please remember pain and pleasure are connected. Uh, when, you, when you take too many aspirins and try to control pain for instant relief, <coughs> you try to manage pain with anesthetics, your management of aesthetics also changes. <laughs> because anesthetic and aesthetic, they are a continuum, one single spectrum. And then when you start taking, when, when I say you, I am not speaking of you, but when, you know, uh, when us, uh, all of us start uh, trying to cure pain through, uh, through a regime of anesthetics, then we also like to have an instant uh, uh, gratification of desire in the field of aesthetics. And therefore, we are no longer able to sit through a, 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 a good recitation of classical uh, uh, you know, music, or we are not able to look at a painting for a long time, we are not able to read a book any longer, it's, it, we find it boring and uh, they interpret it. So when one domain of language goes down, the related domains of language also start going down. To return to that estimation of 6,000 languages, 4,000 will just appear plainly, the remaining set of remaining 2,000, about 1,700, will exist with not all the presently working domains working intact by the end of this century. Now please remember that the longevity, the uh, expectation of life has increased, uh, which means most of you there will be alive to see this wonderful thing happening, that our world, our world will become speechless. There is a Bengali poem. Awak, two, three, awak. Walk, watch up, speech. So this two, three, two, three you understand. In, in, in Bengali, they, they pronounce it as three, three. So the world might become speechless. And aphasia. Can you put up your tongue like this? Just imagine somebody clipping it. And then you are no longer able to speak. And aphasia, aphasia is speech. Aphasia is failure of speech. Aphasia comes because the brain fails to communicate to the speech organs or the speech organs are inefficient to, to, to generate what the brain wants them to generate or there is a psychic disorder or else the fourth variety is what we are experiencing it is imposed on you from outside. In Marathi, there is a lovely word. It's called Muskat Dhabi. <laughs> Don't speak. My school teacher used to tell me, because I was very noisy in school, said, Chubas. Now that kind, when this is done by the state, is frightening. When this is done by what we think is development, the logic of that development, that is frightening. Language is not just something that we use. So you think of how this world was created, this, our, our system, solar system or whatever. If we give it maybe, maybe about uh, 2,000, uh, uh, 250 crores of years to settle down. 
it is only 5 lakh years back that humans started using language and the initial form of language was like amma bobo chu chu so this is the sound uh, other species were trying to communicate communication was necessary for life survival but other species were trying to communicate through eyes sight and eyes absolutely are much better than voice for communication because eyes are biologically honest the eye of a person <laughs> the, the eye of a person ages exactly as much as the body of the person ages but you call a friend whom you not met for the last 15 years and the voice of the friend is still the same or telephone voice does not age with the body it is because the voice is given from outside voice that's how uh, that's why when you when you listen to chinese girls speaking and uh, and mexican girls speaking and bengali girls speaking you find that their voice culture is completely different now it is about 5 lakh years back that we started using we started exploring voice as material sound as material for creating meaning it is about 70000 years ago that we have produced possibly when i say 70000 years please don't think of it as the date of birth of tukaram or shivaji <laughs> is approximately 70000 years so let there be no dispute the doctor daily came and gave wrong date of some somebody writes a letter to me that it was not 70000 years but 69998 years you know please take this in a as if as loose stock 70000 years we use the first sentence meaningful sentence the sentence is not just a linking together of words it requires a lot more it requires a consent of the community to accept the absent spaces in between the nature of the relations of one word with other words uh, the, it requires consent of the community uh, to take all this for granted and only then words together will acquire meaning so 70000 years ago we started speaking you know, sentences and we started producing paragraphs and um, we started producing what is known as discourse it has been a long struggle about 4 lakh 30000 years of struggle of uh, our degree program is 3 years degree post graduation is 2 years but if you have to study for 4 lakh years that's quite a lot so it is not language is not something that we just use it is acquired through lot of effort lot of struggle language is now in the evolutionary process an essential feature of the human species honeybees communicate through dance you know honeybees are extremely good in trigonometry so to indicate the, the minimum distance required to be traveled to the source of honey the queen bee will actually dance and it and show at what angle the bees must fly because their bodies become heated and they have to flap their wings and many of them die they are extremely hard work but many of them die in the process and the bees the, 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 the colony cannot afford death of so many bees on a single day so trigonometry is used but through dance but through speech we alone speak and uh, now language or speech has come to be an essential feature of our being human in other words you take language out of human beings and we are no longer human beings we are some different animal not the same human animal yet we have come to a stage when languages all over the world may suddenly disappear now you may ask me why is it happening has it not happened any time before let me mention in order to tell you a complete story 
After, you know, 70,000 years back, we started producing sentences. Maybe 30,000 years ago, we started producing sentences in the past tense. The past tense did not come as very it, it, was, it was a tremendous struggle. The present tense sentence can talk about what is now, what is here and now. It is all about facts. Or if, if, if I can be, if I can be philosophically a little undisciplined, I might say it's all about truth. Though facts and truth they're different things. The present tense refers to people. The past tense was created about 30,000 years ago. And the past tense is all about things absent. So uh, the past tense is all about, if not truth, about this kind of a lie. So it has taken a tremendous amount of effort to learn to speak lie and so on. <laughs> the past tense. The future is a kind of a mirror image of the past tense and therefore in most languages we find that systems of the future, the forms of future tense in a given language, almost invariably tally with the uh, provision for articulating the past tense in a given language. There are exceptions, but uh, this is generally the case. Creation of sentence 70,000 years ago, creation of the past tense 30,000 years ago. About 10,000 years before our time, most of the languages in the world suddenly started collapsing. They actually perished. Now, what, what was the reason? The reason was, when I say 10,000, again, it is not the date, date of birth for current other name Bukhara. It is general, you know, approximately. The economies of the world made a very big shift at that time. They moved from hunting, gathering stage, to pastoral agricultural stage and uh, uh, that means you have to when you are in the pastoral stage you have to start washing your cows or buffaloes milking them if they are horses you have to feed them if it is agriculture you have to bend your back the spine does not allow that so easily because because of the biological nature of the human animal we are the only animal standing direct all of the fish, birds, animals are parallel to the earth, natural. We have declared a perpetual war against nature and that's how we developed culture. <laughs> 10,000 years back, something of this kind happened. And probably today because there is a major epistemic shift, epistemic shift uh, is a, you know, just as your body is built with cells, knowledge is built with certain building block, building brick. That think of that, think of epistemy as that. So, uh, entire knowledge structure is undergoing a fundamental change. Ferguson College is here today. A hundred years later, Ferguson College might be an absolutely digitalized, digitized long distance educational where you don't get to see professors and you don't get to see students but machines will talk to machines a different that's future for us a, a very major shift in the epistemic major shift in economy and a major disaster in ecology all these three are causing a language disaster for us in simple words, you know, where there are forests, there will be languages. If you have a reforested world, you will have awak, putri, awak. No speechless earth. What is the situation in our country in this world scenario? Uh, in order to describe that, I must take you back in history not by 600 crores or 250 crores or 70,000 crores years, but this time only 100 years. We had, as I said at the beginning, that we, we had a tradition of having many languages. By the way, 
many of us believe that in the beginning there was one language and then it fragmented into many languages. Now that model comes from a certain Western theory of language which in turn was based on the biblical myth of the Tower of Babel. That man could speak with God, or rather God spoke. I, I wonder if man ever spoke with God, but God, man could understand what God was saying. But because man became ambitious, rising aspirations, upward mobility and all those things. And uh, then uh, this, this Tower of Babel collapsed. And uh, finally, there was no possibility of communication. One language fragmented into many languages. Throughout the 17th century, throughout the 16th century, sorry, throughout the 17th century and the 18th century, European linguists uh, kept looking for that original language. Umberto Eco has a lovely book on this whole theme of how people try to trace the origin of all languages to single language. And in our part of the world also, when the, the British arrived here and they set up the Asiatic society, we were very excited that, oh yes, some words of Sanskrit sound like some other words of Persian and those words sound like other words of Latin and Greek and so on. So if Mata means matter means matru and mother, then there must be one language somewhere. That, 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 that is not scientifically tenable, a theory of language origin. Language, or, language takes words out of the material culture of the people, out of the color of the earth, out of the work that you do, out of the food that you eat, out of the animals that you hunt or you, you, you uh, care for, out of the trees you grow, out of the economies that develop in the local areas and so on. So all time through history, there have been many languages that is more natural than having one language. The other thing that I should mention at this stage is, Many of my friends ask me, what's wrong if we have one language? Won't it be you know, all over the world? Won't it bring us development? Won't us, you know, won't us connect with you know, everybody connected with everybody else? My only humble answer is, you see, in the languages of the Himachal Pradesh, there are about 220 words for snow. If those languages were not there and if these people had to understand how the glaciers melt and particularly if the glaciers started where to melt at a frightening the increased speed then these languages what is embedded in these languages will be far more useful for us to cope with the melting of the glaciers than more useful than our getting an expert from Israel or Japan to advise us as to how to contain that natural disaster. So, uh, even if we need to have a language for global understanding, not having other languages is not going to place us in any considerable advantage in any way. So, I return to that history uh, which I was to begin at the beginning of the 19th century, were many languages. And these languages were not just uh, languages of idiots. They were not vulgar languages. Vulgar is Samanya Romancha Bhasha. In Latin in Latin language. The languages spoken by people on the margin of the empire. They were not vulgar languages, vernaculars, vernaculars. So they were not only vernaculars. When I was asked to appear for the seventh standard examination in my school in Pune district, my examination was described as vernacular final work for final or whatever. Vernacular final, it was called vernacular final examination. But my teacher used to tell me it is thing called work for final examination. So these are not vernaculars. They were languages. Their domains were developed. They could communicate about pain, pleasure, imagination, uh, reason, intellect, philosophy, medicine, law were practiced in these languages. There were literary compositions in these languages. Not all very developed literary compositions were necessarily written. Some of them were oral. Incidentally, paper came in, ex in use in our part of the world in the 13th century or 14th century in the north. 
in the 13th century, now parts certainly from the 14th century. There were land records written on paper from the 14th century. Paper was more expensive than it is today. Uh, Mira, many others. So we had these languages, they were rich languages, they were not vulgar languages, they were not vernaculars. We had the tradition, but then came in the at the beginning of the 19th century printing. Marathi got the benefit of printing a little earlier, maybe 25 years before the other languages got the benefit of printing. Gujarati, uh, Mumbai Samachar was printed in 1785, but it was in 1900, beginning of the uh, 19th century, beginning the first decade of the 19th century, that the government printing place was established in Calcutta, same Fort Williams, where we are the capital of a country. And only some languages are put to print. And because the British insisted on writing as the test of truth, and anything that was not written as non-truth, and because writing was given a special status, our writers or our composers, our creators, literary creators, also started using the print medium for composing their literary creativity. And that's how throughout the 19th century in Bangladesh, in Bangla Bhasha, in Marathi, in Kannada, in Gujarati, in Hindi and so on, very major works appear in print. The old traditions came to be seen as, because they were non-printed, they came to be seen as a little less important. This became Sahitya and the other became Loka Sahitya. This becomes literature. Liter the word literature has later as the etymological. That which is based on later is literature. That which is related to later is literature. So this becomes literature. The other became Folk literature, folklore. And folklore was not to be so respected. Literature was to be respected. Throughout the 19th century, the growth of Indian literature sees a vertical split, a great surgery in the field of knowledges, where we have one compartment called literature, written, printed, respectable, venerable. And the other is oral, non-scripted, and therefore less linguistically gifted. At the beginning of the 20th century, it was an Irish woman who for the first time raised this question as to what would be the language or languages that India will use when, as and when India becomes free to rule, to govern. But she was immediately she, she was president of Congress for a while in this country. But uh, she was uh, immediately uh, asked to shut up by the Congress fellows. And so she taught the uh, question, this was in 1914. The World War had started, there were other issues, uh, there were other laws to counter, the economic laws were to counter, and the attention of the country shifted. But in 1926, Nehru raised the question as to what should be the language of India, or languages of India. And uh, while the debate this time was more intense, it still remained unfinished. During the Constituent Assembly, when we were on the threshold of independence, the Constituent Assembly was constituted, was formed. 1946, 1947, 8 and 9, for 4 years they worked, they debated every important issue. They finished their work on the 26th November 1949 and signed the constitution. The, what they signed on was expected to be translated in Hindi as well, but the translated copy in Hindi was not available and the constituted members of the constituent assembly signed a copy and therefore we have in this country only one signed copy of the Indian constitution that is in English, not in Hindi. Two months later we became a republic with the people of India. Uh, and the first sentence of you know, our formation of the republic speaks of plurality of diversity. 
I mean, he doesn't say, I in the name of God or I in the name of history say that people of India should be, we the people of India, we are, you know, multiplicity, plurality, diversity are enshrined in the constitution from the very first, not sentence, but the very first word is in plural. The constituent assembly debated the language question for four years. But whatever was discussed in the, con in the constituent assembly and found a satisfactory conclusion became article in the constitution. Whatever was not concluded, whatever remained uh, contestable, for which uh, matters on which there was no unanimity, all those were turned into the some kind of appendix, appendix. Uh, they were they were made schedules of the constitution. So the language question did not have unanimity, and therefore we did not get clear articles on language or languages of India in the constitution. But we only got a schedule in the constitution. At that stage in 1949, that that the number, the schedules are given numbers and this one is the 8th in the sequence. So it is called the 8th schedule of the constitution and henceforth I will simply use the 8th schedule for ease, for convenience. So the 8th schedule had only, uh, the 8th schedule at that stage had a list of 14 languages. Today it has a list of 22 languages. Some languages were added to the list, that the initial list. <coughs> So you will ask me, sir, but uh, and where is the harm? Languages have been there and people have been speaking. So how does the age schedule matter at all? Because the constitution does not teach us how to speak languages or it does not ask us to stop speaking languages. The constitution had certain implicit bindings on the way governance is carried out in this country. Just as they had explicit articles, there were articles which are written, but there is unwritten thing, and that is money on education can be spent in this country only for the languages which are listed in the eight schedule, and therefore no expenditure for development of other languages is simply possible. Some six years later, Pandit Nehru sent H.G. Barbe to Russia to look at how Russia had coped with the language diversity question. And when he came back, the state reorganization commission was, linguistic reorganization commission was set up. And after that, we all know that we struggled here. I was a child, Mumbai Sir Maharashtra, Salah Spaije. We had Maharashtra for Marathi. Linguistic states were created. Gujarat was created for Gujarati speakers, Karnataka for Kannada speakers. Earlier, Dharwad used to be part of us. And we still, you know, every year ritually going to Nepal. My wife comes from Nepal and I still don't know if she's Kannada speaker or Marathi speaker. <laughs> so so she's remained a disputed linguistic area. <laughs> and sometimes we use Marathi and sometimes I try to learn Kannada and so on. So. Linguistic states were created. Bengal, Orissa, Gujarat, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu. We are one country in the world which has linguistically divided states. If linguistic states were created, then we could create states for the languages listed in the H schedule. Languages not listed, languages not listed in the H schedule did not get any states. For instance, Bhili. Delhi is spoken by about 2, 2 crore 50 lakh persons. It's not a small number, it's quite a large number. And 2 crore 50 lakh would mean what? About, uh, about uh, 5 times of money. It's a large, you know, large, large number. But we did not have a Delhi state. But rather, Delhi speakers were distributed part in Maharashtra, part in Gujarat, part in Rajasthan, part in Madhya Pradesh. The same happened in the Gondi speakers, the same happened in Santali speakers, the same happened with speakers of the, you know, the, the, the Mundari or Mundas. Uh, people got fragmented 
and that means in Maharashtra, Delhi speakers became a minority because they were not in one state, they were in four states. So in relation to Marathi, Delhi speakers are minority. And uh, so the, for the children of Delhi speakers, the schools would be in Marathi. Government tried to uh, send very good teachers to tribal villages as we know from the results. <laughs> but since they came from outside, they did not know the language that the children speak. So here is a Marathi speaking teacher he tried to teach Marathi to Hindi children speaking, you know, like children who speak Kurdu, Devali, Pauri and so on, or Wadli and so on. And he, he does not understand what the children speak. And therefore after a couple of years the children are out of the school and they lag behind. And if at all they graduate up to matriculation, they are in the third class and they, when they come to the Ferguson College, uh, they have to face the uh, contempt of the rest of their society because they put extra burden on their teachers. The teacher has to address the last bench in the class and after a while these students drop out. There is a development, clearly a developmental issue involved here in languages. Now ask me, how many languages suffer like this? I mentioned three or four. Uh, Gobi, Bili. Of course, Bili is not one language. Bili is maybe 34 different languages. Gobi is maybe 11 or 12 different varieties and so on. Ask me how many languages suffer like this. To give you a measure, in the 1961 census, census you understand, Janagana, hmm? in 1961 census, the sense, linguistic census data had given a list of 1,652 mother tongues, 1,652 mother tongues spoken in this country, claimed by the people of the country. Now please remember, you know, let's not be too emotional about this figure, please remember that every mother tongue is not necessarily a language, because they come to me and ask me what is your language and I say my language is Vaishali because I, I, I was sitting in hotel Vaishali having chai <laughs> and it has, to, it has to reflect in the list because the census has no freedom to uh, weed out information to your people. So, uh, but if you were to calibrate how many of the 1652 are really languages you would arrive at a, 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 they have gone through that exercise uh, and approximately a figure of about 1100 languages. Approximately 1100 languages in 1961. Ten years later, ten years is exactly Tacha uh, Bhutaji Sankhya. When the census data came out, it had a list of 108. 1652. Minus 108. Who is the brightest? Is almost 1550. Sare Pagalashi Bhasha Khatma Tenke. The names were removed. There was one more name, 109, which read all others. All others. So that item included 1550. Why did they do this? You know the census data is revealed, it, it takes some time. So uh, by the time the data came out it was 77, year 19, not, it was not 1971 but 77 or 78. In the intervening, in the, in the period in between, a big war had taken place in our part of the world. East Pakistan and West Pakistan used to be a single country and India was in between very nicely like like you know we are like the older brother our hands are held by two younger brothers and we that was the image but suddenly east and west fell apart and one of the important issues for that big war between east pakistan and west pakistan uh, where where india also intervened as big brother uh, was uh, language so our government felt that if Pakistan can split up on the language issue, 
India to can split up on language issue. And the government was worried about uh, linguistic fragmentation, and as it is, the memories of linguistic states were very fresh in people's minds. Because the Uttaknas, those who lost their lives in the struggle, all that uh, rituals were happening, annual worship, uh, and uh, remembering the great souls who created linguistic states. So, all that was in the political era, and so the government felt we cannot possibly disclose names of so many languages. So, when, uh, when the linguistic state reorganization commission was set up, the Russian uh, case study was. Uh, brought into picture, Russia had a figure of this 10,000 which we had not used in India. The Indian government decided to use that figure for the 1971 census and if a language was spoken by more than 10,000, it was called language. If it was spoken by less than 10,000 person, it was not to be included in the list of the census data. And that's how we ended up getting a very shorter list of languages. So, with the state formation of with printing, already many languages were affected. With, because it was only printing available for some languages. All other languages languished. They became non-truthful languages, non viable languages. They became folklorish, they became local bhashas. With the state formation, linguistic state formation, the, those who spoke those local bhashas, the non-written languages, became marginal citizens. Then their citizenship right, linguistic citizenship, linguistic citizenship right was denied completely after 1971 and that practice continues. In the last census, we have a list of 120 languages. Now ask me, why should we not lose those languages? Won't it be a good idea? Can we, after all, afford to teach in the Ferguson College, uh, in Delhi, in the Pardi language, or in language of the waters, in the language of the, you know, those people who catch uh, the rabbits, or those who uh, bring those parrots to tell you, you know, those fortune tellers bringing those parrots, Aswal Wale, Popat Wale, Harki Wale, Kasav Wale, Aswal Wale, Kencha Bhasha. College we are a Ferguson college, we are a Wellington college, we are, uh, we are a university and university is supposed to deal with universal knowledge and how these languages have no knowledge base. So how can they be? Those, those arguments are going out, accepted, closed, received with so much assurance that we are, all of us, all of us, me not excluded, all of us are mentally prepared to wish away the existence of those languages. So much so that even the speakers of these languages have internalized our passivity, our, our conformist attitude, and even they feel that they must study English alone. And that's why today you find that in every village, there are more English medium schools than the local language schools. It will be a sad day when India loses its linguistic diversity. If you think of the global situation, you will notice that everywhere, wherever there is colonial experience, the local languages are wiped out. The Germans, the Dutch, the French, the, 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 the English, wherever they went, they wiped out the local languages. The languages in Canada are more or less completely gone. Today they speak of only French, English, Gujarati and Punjabi as the four major languages there, languages of Canada. This is actually so. In their you know, annual report, these languages and Malayalam. In Australia, some native languages remain, but they remain at the level of museum pieces. Special areas demarcated. In New Zealand, out of their many universities, out of their few universities, four are meant for Maori, Maori medium. 
but there all education is in English. Maori universities also educate students in English and they have one class in one degree program in Maori. And there are no takers for that. New Zealand, Canada, Australia, United States. Their languages were wiped out. This happened in Latin America, where the Spanish went completely gone. It is only in this country, only in this country, mark my words, despite a long colonial experience, we managed to preserve our languages. There must be something unique about us. Please don't underestimate it. Please don't give, give it away easy, you know, so easily. There has to be some reason why, you know, Macaulay brought English here, etc. Even Rajaram Mohan tried to bring English. He spent almost 18 years meeting every, you know, he visited every lord in the British Parliament, arguing in favor of English education. Many of us, we thought, Vagini is a Buddha Prado, Vagabache, Fakare, Bhanda, Makapare. Vagini is a Buddha Ji. We went for it. Yet, all those who study English, wrote in Marathi, or in Gujarati, or Mahatma Gandhi, for, he studied in a British university, but he wrote in all these major books are in Gujarati. Only in this country, despite colonial operation, despite the colonial bias against the local languages, we have preserved languages. In the global situation, if you think of countries that have numerous languages, you can name the following countries yeah, in, in, in the descending order. Papua New Guinea. You heard of this country? This, no, it's somewhere between, it's somewhere close to Australia. Australia, Ujwaya, Padana, Islands, Hoveria, Shiaita, the Papua New Guinea mountains. So that country used to have 1100 languages. 50 years ago. Today, they are not able to trace more than 300 languages. Then comes Indonesia, which had 50 years ago 800 languages. And today they are not able to speak of more than 350 languages. Their main language is Bhasha. 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 Voice. Definition. Siddha Pradnesya Ka Bhasha. Gita Mande Gita. What is the definition of Siddha Pradnesya? So Bhasha means definition, Bhasha means voice, Bhasha means language. Nigeria, which had upwards of 400 or 500 languages, their situation is they have come to less than 3. That is 3, their number of languages is less than 100 in their country. In our country, despite the pre-technology intervention, colonial intervention. Despite the state, linguistic state formation, that is the, as the impact of idea of nationalism. See, when the idea of nationalism surfaced in Europe, it, it impacted us and uh, many of us accepted, we started in national struggle, freedom struggle. But please remember that Gandhi, Tagore and Sri Aurobindo who started and of course you have to Swaraj, Mazai, Janma, So, but Tilak did not live to the end of you know, that struggle, but Aurobindo and Tagore, Aurobindo and Gandhi lived to the